Good morning. I see I have five minutes. I'm going to keep you here a little over time. Uh, the good news is I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, uh, so nothing will go wrong. And there is a little gizmo here, and I'm not sure what it does. Um, in any case, uh, it's incredibly appropriate uh, that we have this topic here today as we sit comfortably in our seats, knowing that, uh, Stephen has said, uh, the the uh, floor is going to collapse and the ceiling is going to come down on us a few hundred feet from the Hayward Fault, which um, <laughs> Carol and her colleagues ha have identified as the one most likely to break in the near future. And also the other uh, really uh, appropriate matter is the fact that we're uh, also here today and, and there's no real Bancroft building because that's being uh, retrofitted. Uh, and um, <laughs> I think uh, that's uh, an incredibly good thing uh, because uh, not only in terms of earthquake safety, but maybe in aesthetics, as I'll get into later, uh, it'll be a much uh, different uh, structure. Um, I claim a number of, of distinctions uh, other than, the, than what uh, Teresa uh, cited in my uh, resume. Um, I am, uh, having sat through the sessions yesterday and today, one of the few, if not the only, non-academic. Um, I have no advanced degree. How many of you have advanced degrees here? Could you raise your hands? Well, my goodness. I barely got through my undergraduate years with a C-plus average. <laughs> um, and my second claim to fame uh, might not be quite as unique as somebody else cited. I'm the only researcher who regularly used the reading room who got the privilege to work within the bowels of the old Bancroft uh, library. I worked as the consultant for the huge Bancroft online website. Um, and I worked at that for uh, three years. And believe me, uh, for those of you who've never had the privilege to go beyond the locked doors, you had the best room that existed in the building, and that includes the director's office, which was rather crowded. The reading room was the most pleasant place to be, and uh, what you found in the back there was a place that was hot, uh, crowded, and if you came to work on a day when the sprinkler system had accidentally discharged the night before, as it did on occasion, the library would be closed and there would be a truck pulled up in which they would be drying out the volumes. In any case, uh, I had a wonderful time working with with uh, Teresa and James Eason, Susan Snyder, Chris McDonald, and Joyce Mao. And it was just wonderful to hear Joyce Mao yesterday uh, talk here. And I think what Charles has done here is uh, given uh, the youth, the people who are coming uh, up and back of us old geezers here, a chance to show that, in fact, we'll, we'll be replaced with a lot of quality. And it was great to hear from them, not only yesterday, um, but today, and I'm sure uh, later. Um, I tell stories. Uh, I'm different in a number of ways. I have to depend on my writing for an income. Uh, if you write serious nonfiction, that's impossible. My wife, who's a bookkeeper, uh, earns two-thirds of the income. But I tell stories. I'm interested. <laughs> oh, you think that's funny. Uh, the author... <laughs> The Authors Guild once ran a survey, uh, um, uh, out of 250 uh, writers placed, 249 farm workers were 250 in terms of annual income. Uh, I think if you looked at my IRS records, that would uh, document that. In any case, I tell stories. I've told a, a number of stories. The most recent story is of the 1906 uh, fire uh, and earthquake, and other stories I've told of the Colorado River in the west, uh, of a nuclear fallout of a natural and human history of California and this latest book which is the third book in the trilogy uh, that I've just completed and I've had enough of earthquakes I uh, April 19th I am completely off the subject and spending my time completely on Wallace Stegner who's just a wonderful uh, subject um, so I don't have a point of view to put forward. I don't have a thesis. Uh, I follow the material. Uh, where will the material take me? I do have to give an editor a proposal, which he or her buys, uh, but I don't have to hew to it because I'm not a specialist. I'm a grazer. Uh, I graze in the American West. Uh, from what I've heard in previous days uh, are people who not only graze in the archives here, but grave, graze very specially. I go down to the roots with uh, any number of 
of species of plants. What I've heard is a number of you going down to the roots and even beyond that in one species of plant. But I hop around, and in that uh, hopping around, it's most important for me to tell a story, to base it on uh, characters, if, uh, if I can. Now, it so happened uh, that uh, uh, whatever Nicholson Baker said about the card catalog, I'm very glad it's gone. It was aesthetically a wonderful uh, device in these beautiful cabinets, but you can't beat, especially if you're not on campus, uh, electronic uh, 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 and Gladys and Melville and the access to what's here from a distance to plan your stay and, in fact, to give you some idea of where your subject lies. And so when I started work on this uh, book uh, approximately four years ago, I put in Earthquake San Francisco and a number of things came up, and there was James Phelan. Uh, and that was interesting. And I came over here, and I spent any number of days, and Phelan uh, uh, gave me the first take on the fact that this was not only a story of building construction, as Stephen has pointed out, of fire, which was I agree with him, the greatest destroyer, uh, you know, 28,000 structures, uh, those steel buildings held up, but the insides caught like torches. Uh, and it wasn't uh, the story only of the mayor, uh, of, uh, uh, of other people. It was the story of a shift in political power from the pro-labor government of Mayor Schmitz and Abraham Roof to the uh, pro-capitalist, progressive gov uh, municipal government of James Phelan, Rudolf Spreckels, uh, and the people that they brought into power. And the Chinese knew of this shift. Uh, the Chinese have 3,000 years of history uh, of dealing with massive natural disasters. And they very clearly figured out that given a large natural disaster, there would be regime change. And the emperors knew that, and the Chinese communists during the 1970s, when there was a number of uh, very disastrous earthquakes, number of dead mounting to 800,000, maybe uh, a million people. The Chinese communists were all over that place trying to make some difference. Uh, they couldn't, uh, but they attempted to. So what I thought was the most interesting part of the earthquake and fire was not the before and during, and I spend lots of pages on that to set up the after, to set up the shift in political power, to set up the effect of a natural, uh, an unnatural disaster, could be warfare, on, uh, on the people, on the culture, on the social aspects, on the economics, and in some way trying to indicate this, this shapes us. Um, I started on this theme in a book called The Seven States of California, and the very first line is, uh, how does landscape determine history and destiny? To some extent, I don't know. And I followed that inquiry all the way through these three earthquake books. And the best proof I can offer is the, uh, in 1906, there's other proofs also, was the change from the, in the type of government. Now, what happened? There are clear parallels with 9-11, and I draw that in the book, and in the preface to the paperback uh, edition of the 1906 book, which will be coming out in a couple of months, the new preface will have clear parallels to New Orleans. I trace it in the present book back to the Chicago fire of 1872, to the Galveston earth, uh, uh, hur hurricane of 1900, in each case, on a municipal level, there was a change in regime. What happened was that the existing government, for whatever reason, ceased to function. Well, for whatever reason, the reason is obvious. How can you function in a huge natural disaster? How could President Bush or FEMA really figure out what was happening? No, you can say they should have done this, they should have done that. The very nature of these disasters, if you've been in them, if you've been near them, if you've watched, if you've traced the record, you cannot deal with chaos until a few days or months or years afterwards. I'm sorry, it's impossible. We don't like to believe that we live in a chaotic world, and usually we don't. But when it occurs, it is chaotic. And I've been in chaos, I've been in wars, I've been in urban riots, I was in the Ambassador Hotel when Bobby Kennedy got shot, I've been in anti-war riots as a journalist, and I didn't know what was going on. I could only write some meaningless story, nor can anyone else really function under those conditions. So what happened in San Francisco was the fact 
vacuum was filled by an oligarchy, an elite, people who had a vested interest in the commercial aspects uh, and cultural aspects of San Francisco. And they took over the government. And those were mostly the progressives, headed by James Phelan. And he travels through this whole history, and he's a wonderful character, but he has an antagonist, uh, and that's uh, Abraham Roof. Um, James Phelan is the Irish Catholic, and Abraham Roof is the French Jew. And there's a wonderful uh, uh, and very clear differentiation between them both. And both of them tie into the University of California. All of uh, Phelan's papers here are a massive amount of papers. The fool never had, never really went through and censored them. There are receipts from his mistress for services performed. <laughs> Lord, that reminds me, I better take a look at mine. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, Roof uh, asked his ancestors to destroy all his papers, but there's enough written by Roof by other people so that Phelan, the white prince, becomes a figure of grayness, and Roof, the dark, uh, looming figure, becomes also a figure of gray, mixed gray. And how realistic is that? How human? We all are gray. None of us are one or the other. So I resurrect Roof, and I sort of demote Phelan. But what comes out of it, I think, is a very clear story and a very clear example of one of the untold effects, one of the non-physical, very difficult to measure effects of these massive disasters. And I'll only uh, go into one other, uh, and that is what starts the book out. And that's a class at the University of uh, California in psychology, 250 members in it, 11 years after the professor, whose name I've forgotten, but I dug this out of the Bancroft, asked them to write their memory of what happened in 1906. And they're seven, they were five years old, and they're 16, 17, 18 years old now. And if you read through those compositions, you can see the fear and the trauma lasting. Someone can't sleep. Someone, every, uh, someone who doesn't hear thunder crawls under the bed. There are any number of traumatic experiences which don't leave us, which remain, remain in the culture, remain in ourselves. And I think, to me, that's the most fascinating fascinating part of uh, these large disasters because they speak to who we are today. We are a little bit different in California for any number of reasons because if you've lived here for any uh, period of time, you've been exposed to one of these and the culture to some extent shows that, demonstrates it in ways which I've uh, written about. Now, how do I know this uh, other than what's in the record? I live and have lived for the last 30 years adjacent to the San Andreas Fault. First on the Pacific Plate, 40 miles northwest uh, of uh, San Francisco and Tomales, Tomales Bay, and then on the North Atlantic Plate. Physically, they're very two different structures. And I'm very well aware as I work looking out on the San Andreas Fault that in some way, this has formed who I am. So that's why I've undertaken uh, these inquiries. But they're not the only ones I've undertaken, and I'll uh, end up uh, on, a, on a tribute to the Bancroft Library um, f in terms of my other books, because I think it's very important. Um, first of all, there are two people, one of whom is here today, who have worked extensively in the Bancroft, and I consider them, at least in my terms, as the California Medici. One is Jim Holliday, who is still here, I think, uh, or he was here earlier. Uh, he uh, 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 told Simon Schuster that I was a, a possible author for a Wells Fargo in the West book, and in fact, uh, the Wells Fargo are sponsoring our appearances today, and that book did happen. Thank you very much, Jim. I don't know where you went, but maybe you knew I was going to talk. And there was Kevin Starr uh, yesterday, who is the, uh, uh, not only uh, 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 a Medici patron, but has grandchildren. Uh, there's my book, there's the website, there's a wonderful exhibit of the California Historical Society, which I was curator of uh, uh, Jack London and, and the West. And there's a, an exhibit and a book at the Legion of Honor uh, done by Mark Klett. All of these drew on the Bancroft, the Mark Klett images and everything else. Uh, going beyond that, uh, just listening to what was said this morning, uh, okay, there was the slide shown of the 1851 
fire. That fire became part of my book of, of terms of what uh, previous uh, disasters struck. There was a picture, there was this wonderful de depiction of La Perouse. He's one of the most fascinating people. He's at the center of my book called Wireless Alaska, the second in the trilogy. He deals with a bay in Alaska where he arrives uh, and with this incredible expedition, the best minds of European enlightenment disappears in the Pacific Ocean, is never seen again. There are the names of the people who uh, have either been in the audience or spoken here, Bill Deverell, uh, where they've all drawn, and I've drawn on them for this book, Ray Brecken, I drew on him, Gershwin, Kevin Starr, Philip Ethington, and I can only say that uh, uh, I hope uh, and pray uh, that the new library uh, has as pleasant a reading room as the old one, and that the staff uh, has nicer, more pleasant offices, and that your office, and that your hours go back to normal, and we don't have to call for as many books from NRLF. Thank you very much. Thank you.